This morning in our study, we are continuing our consideration of what some people call social sins. I stated to you last week that I had had a request from the elders to speak about some of these matters, such as social drinking, immodesty, dancing. And last Sunday we spoke, or we studied about, and I spoke to you about dancing. I recognize that things of this nature are not the most popular topics about which one can preach. But I do have a responsibility to God, and I will fulfill that responsibility to preach the truth about these things that are sinful. The Bible teaches us that the Christian life involves a separation from the evils of this world. In Romans 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul said, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that true and perfect and acceptable will of God. And the word world in that passage of Scripture refers to the present age. And in fact, it is so translated in some scriptures, in some translations. In 1 John 2.15, John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the works therein. As according to Peter in 2 Peter 3, but he that doeth the will of my Father abideth forever. Those of us who hold on to this world are holding on to a false foundation. Those of us who are set on doing what pleases the world are misguided and misdirected about what is really valuable and important in life. Those of us who are set upon pleasing God and seeking his approval, as we prayed a moment ago, are people whose lives and whose minds are headed in the right direction. And it is upon that basis that we approach our study this morning. It is important, I think, for me to restate one thing that I stated last week. That when we study such things as dancing or immodesty, and social drinking, as we shall do this morning, we, meet, we need to realize that the Bible does not specifically condemn these things in explicit statements. By that I simply mean the Bible does not explicitly say dancing is a sin and everybody who dances is going to hell. The Bible does not explicitly say that social drinking is a sin and that anybody who drinks one drop of an alcoholic beverage is going to hell. The Bible does not explicitly state that anybody who wears a bathing suit out in the public is going to hell. The Bible doesn't say that explicitly. But the Bible does deal with those matters. And the Bible does teach us principles upon which you and I can base a decision as to whether or not these things are right. And that's the basis upon which I approach the study. It is not my purpose. Are you listening? It is not my purpose in this study to get up here and give you a set of rules for you to follow according to the rules that I've given you. I don't have that privilege in the first place. And I don't have that responsibility. It is instead my purpose and my responsibility to preach to you what the Bible says about these matters <clears throat> and then to challenge you, to motivate you, and to exhort you to follow the principles given in God's Word. That's what my responsibility is. And then that, in turn, places a responsibility upon you. 
And as I said last week, our decision about whether or not to drink or to dance and so on, our decisions about those things ought to be based upon a personal conviction of truth, a personal conviction of what is right, and not just upon what mama and daddy and the preachers and Sunday school teachers and others have told us. We don't need to inherit our faith. We don't need to inherit our convictions. We need to know ourselves what the truth is. You and I today are a part of a society that has many, many problems. And one of the major problems that we face in our society today is that of social drinking and alcoholism. There are very few social functions that are conducted anymore. But what drinks, alcoholic beverages that is, are served or at least offered. There are very few television shows and very few movies that are produced anymore. But what at some time or another, drinking is a part of the plot or a part of the behavior of those who are the leading characters. Drinking has become a regular part today of good business. And a few years ago when Reagan was doing the tax reform, that was one of the major points of discussion about whether or not the businessmen would be able to count their martinis at lunch as a deduction as a business expense. It has become a major part of our society, in other words. And sadly today, social drinking has become a much greater problem in the church than it has been in years past. In recent years, more and more professing Christians have begun to drink. And the adults who do so, do so either just for the pleasure of it or they do so out of social pressure. And the teenagers who do so usually start doing so because of peer pressure. And adults who do so because of social pressure and business relationships ought to be very slow about pointing an accusing finger at any teenager for starting it out of peer pressure when you do it out of social pressure. For really, that's only a matter of semantics. You're calling it one thing and they're calling it another. But whether you do it out of pleasure, or out of pressure, or out of sheer rebellion, I want you to think seriously about the role that you have as a part of the spiritual body of Christ. Once the church stood firm against this evil. But now, as I said, there are professing Christians who do it, but there are many professing Christians who do not drink who have difficulty giving a clear and distinct and convincing argument against it. And in fact, sadly, there are many who not only cannot give a clear and convincing argument against it, but who will defend it. And while some will admit that drunkenness is a sin, they'll openly defend moderate drinking. So what does the Bible say about all of this matter? This morning it is my purpose to do two things. First of all, I will give to you two reasons why social drinking is wrong according to the Bible. And then it will be my purpose to examine two scriptures that are used by some to try to defend social drinking. And then we will draw our lesson to a close. I think it expedient for me to begin by restating something very firmly, very clearly. Listen to this quotation from God's Word. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the quotation from Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. In that passage of scripture, the apostle Paul makes it clear and emphatic that drunkenness is a work of the flesh, that it is a sin, and that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I began this morning when as we consider this matter of social drinking, by reemphasizing to you the fact that drunkenness is a sin, that alcoholism is not just a disease. It is not just a sickness, it is a sin. Now I know I just set myself up as a huge target for a lot of people, for it seems that I never say that on television, radio, or in the pulpit. But what somebody is ready to come at me charging with all that they have in them with some kind of an impassioned plea for me to reconsider that matter. But until you can find a way to eliminate Galatians 5, 19 through 21 from the Bible, I am compelled from God to declare it to be a sin. It is as Peter L. Renan said in the Gospel Advocate a few years ago, alcoholism is a disease. If so, it is the only disease that is contracted by an act of the will. It is the only disease that requires a license to propagate it. It is the only disease that is bottled and sold. It is the only disease that promotes crime. It is the only disease that is habit forming. It is the only disease that is spread by advertising. And it's the only disease that is given for a Christmas present. Alcoholism may be a disease. There are maybe some who are alcoholics who are sick as the word is used in the medical world and in the psychological and psychiatry world. But it is not just a disease, it is a sin. Now having said that, here are the two reasons that I believe social drinking is wrong. First of all, I believe it is wrong because of what it may lead to. It may lead to addiction to alcoholism, and after all, I remind you, that is still our number one drug problem. It's not cocaine, it's not heroin, it's not crack, it's alcohol. That is still our number one drug problem. And anyone who begins to drink socially or who begins with the first drink under any circumstance is playing a dangerous game and may be taking the first step toward an addiction. After all, all of those millions, and they are in the millions, those millions of people in our nation today who are declared to be or who openly confess to be alcoholic began with one drink. They weren't that way overnight. And while it may be true that some people have a strength within them to maintain a moderate level of drinking for years and years, you may not be one of them. You may not have that strength. And you may be the next one to become an alcoholic, to become addicted. And at that point, I need to remind you <coughs> that addiction, addiction is really just a matter of degrees. There are those who will say, well, uh, I don't drink that much. It, I mean, it's just like, I just have one a day. But do you have to have that one a day? Brother Flavel Yakely, in an article that he wrote on social drinking a few years ago, said the only difference between a social drinker and a drunkard is a difference of degree. Because when you think about it, the man who cannot get through a day without a drink and the person who cannot get through an hour without a drink 
only really have one difference between them, and that's just the degree of their addiction, just the amount they're drinking. A second reason why social drinking is wrong is a reason that I gave you last week regarding dancing. And it is a reason that you will come to understand is common to all studies of these matters of social sins. And that's the matter of influence. I want you to read your Bible with me to now, now at a certain spot. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Romans, and I want you to read a couple of verses with me that relate not only in principle to this matter, but that relate directly to this matter. In this matter of Paul's discussion in Romans 14, Paul was writing about the eating of meat, which within itself was not wrong. But in writing about eating of meat, he made some statements about how we ought to look at our influence upon those who are our brothers in Christ. Read with me now verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. That means to condemn. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Look down now at verse 21. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now the principle that Paul gave there is this. <clears throat> that eating meat is not wrong with me, for me. I can eat a piece of meat, and that's not wrong. But if I find out that my eating of meat is going to make my brother, who's already weak regarding that, if I find out that that's going to make him stumble and cause him to fall, I will not eat meat anymore as long as I live. And that passage in Romans 14 has a parallel in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which Charles Burns read for us last week in verses 10 through 13 of the 8th chapter. And it simply says that you and I cannot escape the impact of influence upon people around us. A few years ago when we were living in Huntsville, I had occasion to work with a recovered alcoholic by the name of Charlie Parsley. Charlie was a man who started drinking when he was in the Navy. And he said, David, I can probably count on the fingers of my two hands the days that I've been sober since I came out of the service until the day that I was 33 years old. He said, can you imagine what it means to a man like me? Can you imagine what it does to a man like me to sit in a Bible class and hear some of my professing brethren defend drinking alcoholic beverages? Can you imagine what it does to me when I just walk down the street and pass by a liquor store. He said, I'm strong enough now spiritually that, that that part doesn't bother me much anymore. It doesn't hold much of a temptation anymore. But he said, David, there were years when all I would have had, to, had all I needed to be right back in that bottle again was just the slightest little nudge. And he said, I looked, I'll remember to the day I die, how he said this to me, he said, I looked for those strong Christians who would set the good example for me to keep me sober. Now that 
is an example for that might be different from the fellow sitting next to you today. But the person near you today may be struggling in some way or another. And that's what Paul's talking about. And I wonder about how many parents are going to answer to God for the influence that they had upon their sons and their daughters in matters like this because of the examples that they set. That they set when they were at home. They set those examples by the fact that every time the refrigerator was opened by that son or daughter, they saw liquor there. Beer in the refrigerator, liquor up in the cabinet. The influence that that had. The Christian has to be concerned about his influence. You and I live in a world today, listen to this. We live in a world today where there are countless thousands of people who don't even go to church who look upon drinking as an evil, who will quickly condemn social drinking, as long as you and I live in a world that has people, non-religious people in it like that, there's no way that you can engage in social drinking without weakening your influence. And if you can't find anything else in God's word and in your reasoning as a cause for you to not be a social drinker, that within itself ought to be sufficient reason. Quickly, two of the scriptures that are used to try to justify social drinking are 1 Timothy 5.23 and John 2, 1 through 11. In 1 Timothy 5, 23, that's the passage in which the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, No longer drink water, but drink a little wine for your stomach's sake, for your infirmities. There are those who will read that and appeal to it as a justification for drinking. <laughs> I get the impression sometimes that they read that verse and think it says, Well, now everybody who wishes to drink socially may do so now with God's approval. But the passage doesn't say that. It's a far cry from that. You must recognize the fact that the Apostle Paul had to write it, thus indicating that Timothy had an aversion to it to begin with. And you have to begin to wonder why that was. But then you understand as you read it that it dealt with medicinal purposes. It was a medicinal remedy. Much like you and I might be told by a doctor, I want you to get you a bottle of this cough syrup and take this syrup to stop that coughing. And then you read the, in, the label and you find that a part of the ingredients includes alcohol. NyQuil, for an example, is one of those that's loaded with it. And you say, well, oh, anything's got alcohol in it, it'll never pass over my lips. And the doctor said, well, but this is something that you need for medical reasons. So it has nothing to do with social drinking. And that which the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy 5 <clears throat> is a far cry from drinking with a group of your friends at a party. Don't look to 1 Timothy 5 to justify social drinking. And the other passage that seems to be the most common the one in appealing to the scriptures to try to justify social drinking is John chapter 2 in which Jesus turned water to wine. I want to read to you a couple of things about that. W.D. Jeff Coat wrote a book entitled The Bible and Social Drinking. It is one of the most exhaustive works on that that I know of, and you would do well to add that to your library and read that book. It is an excellent treatment of this matter. Brother Jeff Coat, in his conclusion of it, said there is nothing in the context of John 2, 1 through 11 to indicate that Jesus sanctioned strong drink. 
Mr. Albert Barnes in his commentary on that passage of scripture said, the wine referred to here was doubtless such as was commonly drunk in Palestine. That was the pure juice of the grape. It was not branded wine, nor drugged wine, nor wine compounded of various substances, such as we drink in this land. The common wine drunk in Palestine was that which was the simple juice of the grape, and there's not the slightest evidence that the word so used here would have conveyed any idea but that of the pure juice of the grape. Brother Guy in Woods in his commentary on this passage of Scripture said, It is significant that intoxicating liquors of whatever nature are positively forbidden in the sacred writings, and there is nothing here or elsewhere in the Scriptures to justify their use as a beverage and stimulant. We may be sure that our Lord did not endorse by his action in this situation, that which deity forbids throughout the Bible. To be more specific, throughout the Bible, God pronounces strong drink as an abomination to man and forbids man to indulge in such. How in the world could anybody accuse Jesus Christ then of manufacturing that which the Lord so vehemently condemns and plainly condemns throughout other places in the Bible. Jesus simply did nothing here other than what nature had done many times or had been done through a natural process. The only difference was the length of time that he took. The conclusion of it all is this, drawing it to a close, listen carefully. I believe with all of my heart that there is no biblical nor sensible justification for social drinking. The sensible and the scriptural thing for every child of God to do is just as the campaign has said for years, just say no. Did you hear that passage did you hear that passage that was read for us earlier this morning? The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying, that saying no, ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Open your songbooks to the number announced. I'm Jeff Archie for the International Gospel Hour. In Matthew twenty-two twenty-seven, 27, Pilate asked the question, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Dear friends, what will we do with Jesus? Let's heed his words from John 5, 39 to search the scriptures. Join us every day on the International Gospel Hour as we search the scriptures here on WJHFLP Florence, Alabama, 106.9 FM. Hello, I'm Jim Dearman, host of Good News Today. I'd like to invite you to join us for Good News Today every morning at 8 a.m. local time here on GBN Radio. My name is Cliff Goodwin, and I want to welcome you here today for another edition of Searching the Scriptures. I hope that you've joined me with a Bible in hand, and I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, as we introduce today's study, what I would like for us to do is to read the first six verses together from this chapter. So let us begin in 1 Kings 18 
and verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all fountains of water, and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself." Now, in these first six verses of the chapter, we have this, the stage set for our study here today. As this chapter opens, we're reminded of the great famine that was over the land of Israel in the days of Elijah. Now, this was such a great famine that over in the New Testament, both our Lord Jesus Christ himself, as well as the inspired penman, James, both referenced this historical uh, event or occurrence, the great famine. In fact, we learn from James chapter 5 that the famine and lasted some three and one-half years. And so we read here that at this time in 1 Kings chapter 18 that the famine was sore indeed in Samaria. Now, what about these circumstances? And what kind of hero, so to speak, might we find in a time such as this. Now obviously we're all familiar with Elijah and we know his role in not only this chapter but in the chapters preceding 18 as well as in the chapters following this one. We're familiar somewhat at least with Elijah. But here we've read about another man. I would submit to you another hero of faith a man by the name of Obadiah. Now I want you to go back to the text we read and notice the latter portion of verse 3. It's the beginning of a parenthetical phrase. It says, Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. The title of our study here today is A Man Who Feared the Lord. And I love this description of Obadiah. Very simply put there at the conclusion of verse 3, Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Ahab, who was a very wicked man, a wicked ruler in fact, Ahab was a very powerful man, and yet as powerful and as fearful in a sense as the king of Israel might have been, Obadiah knew and understood that there was one to be more greatly feared than even Ahab. And his allegiance, his devotion, I'm speaking of Obadiah's, was to Jehovah the true God of heaven and earth, the true God of Israel. Had Israel only acknowledged and served him faithfully as they should have done. Now what I want us to do today in discussing a man who feared the Lord is I would like for us to see two or three considerations or lessons concerning what it means for a man, any man, or any woman for that matter, to fear the God of heaven and to act and to live accordingly. Now, to help us uh, develop these thoughts and to give us our three points, let's continue in our text. Go down to 1 Kings chapter 18 and let's pick up at verse 7 and read a little more together. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him, Obadiah recognized him, and fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go and tell thy Lord, meaning the king Ahab, Behold, Elijah is here. 
And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go and tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Now, if you're writing in your Bible at home, at the end of verse 12, we have come to our first lesson. And you may want to underline this phraseology, but I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. That's very important. What does it mean when we talk about fearing the Lord? Fearing Jehovah, the God of heaven and earth, the true and the living God. Well, lesson number one, dear friends, I want us to see that fearing the Lord is a first consideration. It is a first consideration. Now, in this regard, I use the terminology first in the sense of preeminent or foremost or even most important. And as it goes with preeminent and fundamental needs, it's important that we begin learning these things while young. And it's impressive to me, as we've read here at the end of verse 12, Obadiah was able to say, I have feared the Lord from my youth. In Obadiah's life, fearing the Lord was a first consideration, a preeminent consideration, one that he had had in mind even from his youth, even while young and tender of age. He had learned to fear the Lord and had continued in that instruction. Now, friends, indeed, volumes could be said along these lines that would be applicable to you and to me living today. Those of us who are striving to fear the Lord, to be His faithful servants, and to, to do the best that we can in our lives. Let's think about some of these things together for a few moments. First of all, what about Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1? Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1 begins, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. As we all understand, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by an inspired wise man. I believe it to have been written by King Solomon himself. And here the wise man counsels his hearers. He says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. How sad and unfortunate, yea, even tragic, that far too many living today view youth as a time to be frivolous, to be uh, carefree, and to really be careless regarding spiritual concerns. So many look at youth as a time in which to sow their wild oats with little, if any, regard whatsoever for God, and for the eternal verities. Well, friends, that's wrong. And it's not only wrong, it is a course of action that leads ultimately to disastrous consequences. While we are young, that is the time for us to be learning about the fundamentals of faith, to be learning about the great and eternal verities, the truths that never change. For example, how that God is our creator as he is styled there in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. He's the one who has formed us. We are made in his image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Psalm 100 and verse 3. And not only that, while young, learning the fact that we are created beings of God... We also need to learn that our lives are to be directed and lived in His service. Too few people today realize this, and far too many, or far too little rather, young people are being taught this and emphasize this as it should be. 
I'm going to take my Bible now and open to the book of Psalms. I want you to turn with me in your Bible at home as well to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. And here the psalmist has a great deal to say about children and about youth in a sense. And I believe it would be helpful for us as we realize that fearing the Lord is a first consideration. It's something that needs to be attended to even while young, not to mention being continued in even while we grow old. Look at Psalm 127 and verse 3. Here the psalmist said, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Here, the blessing of children to their parents obviously is being emphasized. But isn't it interesting there in verse 4 that children are likened unto arrows? Now, what is it about arrows that would teach us a very valuable lesson regarding children? Well, perhaps many things, but there's one idea that I would like to bring out presently. You know, when an archer takes an arrow into his bow, and when he draws the bow back and releases the arrow, the arrow is shot in a direction. And a skilled archer is careful to aim that arrow where he wants it to go. The more skillful the archer is, the more accurate the arrow's flight will be. Well, my, how sobering a reality it should be for all of us who are parents, all of us who have children who are arrows, because in a real sense, we as parents are the archers. And as we rear our children in their formative years from the time of their birth until the time that they leave our homes, as we are rearing our children, we are in a sense drawing them back in the bow. And one day they will enter adulthood, they will go out into life on their own, and as it were, we're going to be releasing that arrow. They're going to be shot out into the world, if you will, and really and truly the direction to a large extent the direction of their lives is going to be dependent upon us as parents. We are the archers, in a sense, and our children are the arrows. Now, how sobering that is. And for us as parents, we need to stop and we need to contemplate and even ask ourselves, where am I shooting my children? In what direction am I sending my children out into the world eventually one day. Friends, it is inevitable. If our children live, then one day they will pass into adulthood. They will move out into the world on their own. And it's going to be so important, so important, that their spiritual moorings are as they should be. That the proper foundation has been laid in youth. That first things have truly been kept first and that they grow up and have grown up knowing the fundamentals, the eternal verities that will help to not only direct but even safeguard their lives in the years to come. Certain things our children need to learn first. That is, in their youth, they need to learn these things preeminently. I think about Romans 11 and verse 12, where the Apostle Paul tells us, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. We need to teach our children while they are young, at home, with us, their parents. We need to teach them that God is so good. God indeed is benevolent and loving and good. But at the same time, God is severe. His severity can be seen in stemming from His holiness. God's goodness means that God is also holy. He's pure. He's just. And when His character is violated, when man sins against God, God is also a severe God, Romans 11 and verse 22. And children need to be reared. They need to be taught and brought up 
with that understanding, understanding both aspects or both sides of God, if you will, His goodness and His severity. In Matthew 10, in verse 28, Jesus said, Fear not them which are able to kill the body, and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. God is greatly to be feared. Hebrews 12 and verse 29, Our God is a consuming fire. He is greatly to be feared. And yet at the same time, God is not willing, He's not desirous that any should perish. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Friends and viewers, I would submit to you in the first place here today that fearing the Lord is a first consideration. Something to be instilled and nurtured in youth and to be furthered throughout life. We see that, I believe, in the man Obadiah. But now I want you to move back with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's return to our text and notice a second lesson about fearing the Lord. You go back with me down to verse 13, 1 Kings 18, 13, and Obadiah here is still talking to Elijah. He says, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. <laughs> Well, we've already noticed from the end of verse 3 that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And he, he had done so from his youth, indicating to us this was a first and foremost consideration. But here in the second place, as we note Obadiah's fear of the Lord, I want us to see that such fear also has a family consideration. A family consideration. Now, we've already talked about parents and children and about the responsibilities parents have to rear and guide and even direct their children in the proper path. But here when I use the term family, I'm referring more to the spiritual family of God. God's people. What I love about Obadiah's attitude and how I love the fact that he teaches us something about fearing the Lord is in his life and in his actions, as we've read here in these last couple of verses, his attitude toward the Lord, fear, godly reverence, in other words, also manifested itself in his treatment of God's family, God's servants, the prophets, we read there in verse 13 how that he had taken a hundred prophets of the Lord and hid them by fifty in a cave. Apparently this must have been quite an expansive cave, a large cave, and apparently he was able to hide the hundred prophets in two groups of fifty, perhaps thinking that God forbid if one group were found and slaughtered, that perhaps the other group at least could be spared. Perhaps that was the rationale behind this practice. But at any rate, we see that he had a regard for the family of God. Now friends, please let us not miss this lesson. We cannot say on one hand that I fear the Lord, I love God, I want to do what's right, and then show contempt or disregard at least for God's people. It simply does not work that way. If we fear the Lord, then we're going to respect the Lord's family. We're going to respect God's people, and not only that, we're going to love God's people and seek their best interest. It was because of Obadiah's fearing Jehovah that he did this for Jehovah's prophets, that he went to the risk and, and no doubt jeopardized his own safety, his own life, even at least his own place in the, the king's palace, no doubt, to hide these prophets and to feed them and to take care of them. Well, friends, what about us today? Can we say that we fear the Lord if we do not have the proper attitude toward God's family, fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord? 
Absolutely not. Let's look at some New Testament passages together. Turn over with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to notice verses 2 and 3. Here the Bible reads, By this we know that we love the children of God. Well, that's what we're discussing. John, how can I know that I love the children of God? When we love God and keep His commandments. Notice how that these two are inseparable. Loving God and loving His children are linked. And not only that, keeping His commandments is an integral part of this. An essential, indispensable part of this. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Now, if we read between the lines, so to speak, and I know we have to be careful using that terminology, but I want you to dig more deeply into these two verses, and I don't want you to miss what is implied. In verse 2, he begins by talking about loving the children of God. Now, obviously, that's going to involve our regard for the family of God, the church. It's going to involve our attitude toward the church, the family of God. We love the children of God. But after beginning with that in verse 2, really the rest of the way through verse 2 and verse 3, he highlights personal responsibility. I've got to love God and I've got to keep His commandments. Now why is that? What does my loving God have to do with loving the family of God? Friends, I've said it before and I want to say it again here today. Sin, personal sin, is one of the most irresponsible things I can practice or do as a member of the church. If I am a part of the family of God, a New Testament Christian, then my actions, my faithfulness or unfaithfulness, whichever be the case, it affects the family of God as a whole. And I believe that's one reason why John is touching upon this in such a manner here in 1 John 5, verses 2 and 3. He's impressing upon his readers that if we want to love our brethren, if we want to love the family of God as we ought to, we've got to love God first and foremost and keep His commandments. Personal obedience, personal faithfulness is good for the family as a whole. Where would these prophets have been in Ahab's day had it not been for Obadiah's fearing the Lord, loving the Lord, and reflecting that attitude toward God in his actions toward these prophets? Well, no doubt, like others, they would have been gathered up and slaughtered by the wicked Jezebel. You selected. Screen recording. Button.